Hello everyone, welcome to my show, Going From Thousands to Millions. I'm very, very excited today. I have Mark, also known as Angry Dad, on the show. Mark, hey, how are you, mate? G'day, Sam. How are you, mate? I'm good, thank you. I'm really, really excited, mate, to do this. And I wanted to start off by saying thank you for making the time. I know we, we have met briefly through Mitch, your son, uh, in the last few months. And, um, and what really meant a lot to me was that uh, we were having a conversation, I think, over Instagram, and I... And I asked you to uh, join me on the show, and right away you said yes. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. No, no, pleasure, mate. I look happy to have a chat. At the end of the day, um, you know, in this sort of isolation that we're all sort of going through, there's um, there's, there's a bit of time, but I'm really, really passionate about the the subject matter that we want to um, talk about and touch on as well. So um, no, I appreciate you having me on, mate. No, thank you. So tell me. Um, I'd like to get to know a little bit about your background before we get into the main conversation. Um, where are you from? Were you born here in Australia? Where'd you grow up? Just give us a little bit of your background. What yeah, you did, yeah. What you did, yeah. I'm an Aussie. My, my dad was actually Dutch. So he was born in Holland and he migrated out here when he was about seven. So he married um, my mum, who is an Aussie. And they, um, that, that was, they sort of settled in Hamilton, which is where my mum was. So I was born and bred in the Western District in there. Uh, so stayed there till I was 16, um, ended up leaving at 16 and coming down to, to Melbourne to pursue every childhood sort of boy, country boy's dream and city boy for that matter, but to play AFL footy. So Collingwood, um, in, that, in those days, it wasn't the draft, it was the zone, but they actually uh, put me on their list, so to speak. And I come down here at 16 to, um, to give it a crack and, and see if I can make it in the big league. And what happened? So you started, you play, you made it in, in AFL? Yeah, so I, I played under-19s reserves and was fortunate enough to play seven senior games. I played my first one at uh, 18. I was 18. I played played wow. six in that year in, in 87, but had some sort of feet trouble leading into that 1987 season and sort of went undetected, undiagnosed and ended up being a, a stress fracture, which um, at the end of the day... They operated on nine times to try and fix over a period of about three and a half years. Couldn't fix it. And uh, sort of, well, I didn't play a game after 21 and caught it quits at um, about 23 in terms of the, the whole career. So a bit, bit sort of sad when you, you look back statistically and you had more operations than you played games. <laughs> so tell me, coming to Melbourne at the age of 16, um, I know maybe you wouldn't have thought about it back then, but that was, that was a big deal to get up and move here, right? You know, Sam, as I reflect back in terms of the journey, and, and I recall sort of crying in the mornings getting up because I lived in, in McLeod, out sort of Greensboro way at that point. I boarded with uh, an old lady. She looked after us. There's three of us. Um, but getting up at six o'clock, walking to a train station, because I was an apprentice technician with telecom back then, that I, I was, it was a given, I had to have a job to come down to him, otherwise mum wasn't going to let me. But um, I would cry every morning thinking, I don't need to be at work till about quarter to nine. Here I am getting up at six o'clock, freezing cold, walking to a train station, train station into the city, train station out, walk to work. All of these logistical challenges at 16, it was, it was overwhelming, but I didn't realise at the point just how overwhelming it was until I reflect now. And bloody hell, mate, it, it made you grow up quick and it was really character building. Yeah, because you don't think about it because you just go through the motions. You're on a mission to get somewhere, so you just keep pushing and pushing. Yeah. And then you don't realise even what, what kind of effects that has on you as a person, you know. One of the things that people always say is that, oh, you are who you are because of your childhood, but, you know, I never sat there and thought about my childhood because I was too busy getting on with life. But when you, as you said, when you stop and reflect, you're like, wow, that wasn't easy. For me, for me it was a box ticking exercise, right? Yeah. Collingwood put me on the list, so that's one box tick. Mum said, yeah. you're not going until you got a job. I got the job. It was apprentice to telecom, you know, like a stable job, you know, because you, you didn't footy wasn't your, your full-time earn then. So, and then it was like, good, I've ticked the box I want to go. That's, and that's all you thought about. And then, again, it's not till you have your... I think it's when you have your own kids that you reflect and you go, would you want your kids at 16 to uproot and go overseas or whatever? And the answer is no. We still hold their hand at 26, 23 and 21. Yeah. So, so I get the fact why my mum 
used to cry all the time, missing me. And I'd be saying, oh, shut up. Like, you know what? I, I get it now. And I was probably really arrogant, pig-headed about it and gave her no, I gave her no love back in terms of the fact that her 16-year-old son had left home and will never be coming back. That is so true. That is so true. So tell me, you made it to AFL. That must have been a big moment for you, right? Uh, and I know, and I know, football. Uh, football's always been part of our culture in Australia. It's a massive thing. But as you said, you know, the football players. And correct me if I'm wrong. They weren't superstars back in those those days, and they weren't getting paid the amount of money that they're getting paid these days. So back then, what would it feel like for you to make those sacrifices? And to be able to achieve what you did at such a young age, what did it feel like? Do you ever think about that? You know, it was the ultimate, in all honesty. And especially, it was made even better by the fact it was Collingwood. Like, uh, uh, people, people that play AFL won't necessarily all admit it, but I think the majority of them, if they could play with the team, it would be Collingwood. So to, to eventually do it and play that first game and, again, tick the box to say, you know, wow, what you've worked hard for has come off and you've been rewarded. You know, I look back with the fondest of memories as far as all that's concerned because I was a 901st player to play an AFL senior game for Collingwood. So no one can take that away from you. And I just have to look back and say, oh, my career is about quality, not quantity. And see if that sort of captures it all. <laughs> I love that, but but I love that. That is so true. So tell me, and I don't want to bring back um, painful memories or anything, but um, so when you went through the injury that you had and, um, and when you, um, you realised that, okay, you can't play anymore, um, what did that feel like? Oh, you know, it was like your whole world had caved in on you. And at the end of the day, it took probably five years for reality to set in that I wasn't ever going to play again because, you know, you continue to dream and challenge your mind and all this, but, you know, where your mind was able, your body wasn't. And, you know, again, I can only sort of look back now and join the pieces together in terms of how it all sort of panned out. But I basically, I went into a serious bout of depression without even recognising it or knowing it. And, you know, it was only when Sharon pretty much just grabbed me one day and this is, I was about 25, I think at that point, about to have Dylan or had just had him, um, that she said, you need to actually do something about this or I'm out of here. And and at that, that point then that was about family. So that was about losing her and Dylan. I wasn't a nice person, Sam. I, and you know, I look back on my behaviours then and if someone told me that my sons or daughter were doing shit that I was doing, I would be totally embarrassed and ashamed. I, I would go out, right, and I would be with Sharon, who's my partner, and there wouldn't be one time we went out when I didn't end up in a punch-up. And it's just, I, I'm embarrassed sitting here saying it, but it, it was, again, looking back, it's about that anger, that frustration, that whole build-up of everything inside you not dealing with the reality and the facts of your life, etc. And the way I handled it was through explosions and anger and fights and shit. And it's so, so embarrassing to say it. But for me, I, I say it and I admit it because for people that potentially are going through it, see it as a trigger, as a warning, as a sign that things aren't right and you need to do something about Because that's not normal behaviour, mate. That is not normal behaviour. And today it might be fueled by drugs, shit like that. No drugs around when I was there. You know, that, you, know you might have had someone smoking a bloody hooch or something, but even then didn't see it. This was about my own inability to control myself and the, the built-up anger that was inside me. That's, that's so powerful. I can relate to exactly what you're saying. Um, number one, you don't realise what you're going through. Um, because you're not in a good headspace. So you don't realize you're actually depressed. In, you know, for me, I always thought depression was something that you, when you got depressed, you realized you were depressed. So you went to the doctor and you got some medication. Yeah. So I thought that's what it was. Yeah. 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 I thought you get depressed, something happens when you get depressed. Like you get up and you can't come out of the bed or something in particular has to happen, like a symptom, yeah. right? And then you see that symptom, and then once you see that symptom, you go, okay, well, 
I'll go to the doctor, like a cold and flu, right? Because we don't have, because no one talks about it, right? And, and to hear you say what you just said, you know, we are embarrassed to talk about it because it's looked down on to say, oh, you know, I was out of control, I did this and that. But it is so powerful. It is so powerful to actually speak about it you know, I spent, I, I spent my whole life pretty much on Sundays saying sorry to Sharon for behaviours on the Saturday night. Now, how embarrassing is that? Because at the same time in parallel, you know, I'm introducing a family to the world. You know, Dylan, um, at, at when I was 25 and then Mitch three years later and Hannah three years after that. And at the same time, you know, I, I was a corporate guy, right? So I had some really decent sort of senior exec roles, etc. And again, I look back on it and I almost feel like, I live two separate lives, right? And, and that, that seems weird, I know, but it's reality. Like, while I was dealing with all this sort of shit, I have to go to work and manage businesses. And, you know, one of those businesses had nearly 200, yeah, 200 people in, in the business. And I would have to put the corporate hat on and, and get through the day being professional and really serious and, and mask all of those other emotions and shit that I was feeling and I'd get in the car to drive home and it's almost like that just the trigger would reoccur and, and I'd be back to my normal self and if it wasn't for medication and I touch on this in the documentary I wouldn't yeah. be here Sam it's as simple as that it is as simple as that yeah I totally get you mate you know I've been through exactly similar things in a different manner and I and you know when I look back now it's funny like you know how we having this conversation for the first time um, I feel embarrassed of my actions because I know that as a person, I was totally not that person that, you know, that behavior was not me. Um, and I think for me, um, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, that, you know, I started from nothing and grew what I have till now, all by, you know, myself and my team and my business partner. But I took a lot, lot up on myself. And there was times that um, the trigger for me was that I was working so hard. I was just so much under pressure that I had to have these blowouts and those blowouts were the time that I was actually, that's how I was dealing with my depression without even knowing I was depressed. But I was having these yeah. crazy blowouts, which wasn't me as a person. When I look back now, exactly what you said, I think, wow, wow. You know, I, look, I look back on it and again, it's the only way you can do it, but it's like anything in life, from, you, you actually learn and apply from experience, right? Yeah. And, and for sufferers, for me, that one of the key things uh, in terms of messaging is that accept the fact that you've got it and do something about it. That's a really, really powerful and positive starting point, etc. But recognise and remember also that what got you there in the first place, and as far as I'm concerned, I know it, it, it's that whole football thing imploding. What got you there in the first place isn't necessarily what will take you back back there in terms of deep, deep, dark moments. Know your triggers, know what actually um, does take you there and what you need to do to get yourself out of it because that is really, really important. And, and it's, again, it's clearly all a mental thing and it's to do with your mind and you have all these processes to assist, whether it's medication, talking to experts, professionals, etc. but that is an important part of it. You will continue to go back there. It doesn't leave you, but you get to manage it way, way better. And that's important. But that's about positivity and upside and knowing that tomorrow is always another day. Yeah, I totally agree with you. That is so true. So tell me, um, you released a documentary, right? Um, and, you know, I've spoken to your son, Mitch, about the documentary. I was there on the launch of the documentary. What made you do it? You know how they say things happen for a reason, Sam? Well, one, of, one of the things I did, and, and I knew I did it, but I'd forgotten about it and thought I'd lost it. When, when, when all of this imploded, I sat down back in 1991 and I wrote, I, I hand wrote um, this story titled My Story. And it was 40 odd pages or whatever. Um, and again, it was a brain dump of my experience, my life, the situation, etc. Thought I'd lost it last March. I was cleaning out some stuff. I actually found it and I flicked through it and I looked at it and in it was sort of memories of me sitting down doing it. And there was smudge marks on it from where I was crying while I was writing in it. It was really raw and emotional. It took me back. And I, I actually filmed flicking through it um, and, put, and posted on Instagram. And 
for the first time ever, sort of almost touched on my life in terms of um, how it was that no one else knew. So, because I've never done that to my, my, my closest friends. My, I had, had no idea of any of this predicament. And um, what's been humbling is so many of them reached out and said, oh my God, I didn't realize it was so bad. So that, which has been amazing. So I did that, right? That was on Instagram, got some amazing reaction and response. And for me, it was about, I, I think I, I need to start to be honest with myself, right? I love that, yeah. You, I then was um, to, uh, approached by Welcome Stranger Productions about yeah. it, yeah. yeah, the dream, and I agreed to do it. And I sort of challenged myself with doing it. And the key driver, Sam, if, if you want to know as to why yeah. I finally agreed is, is every day through all this angry dad shit that the boys created, right, I get hundreds of messages, right, from people saying, I'm in this really dark, deep place. And without your videos, without that laughter that you actually bring to my life, I don't know if I could continue. And words to that effect, highlighting society's need um, for laughter, given, you know, just mentally how so many people are this in this day and age. So I, I, and I would respond to these people and I would go, oh, cheers, thanks for reaching out. Yeah, little pricks, ha ha, glad you enjoyed it. Don't encourage them though. But remember, you know, be strong, tomorrow's another day. So I felt I was cheating these people, Sam, because I was giving them a message from Angry Dad who's saying, yeah, be smart. And, and at the same time, I'm thinking, here's me knowing exactly what they're going through because I've been a sufferer for nearly 20 years myself i wanted to validate my response and have it go back to those people as as a response from a sufferer who is qualified to give advice comment or suggest whatever rather than someone who's just flippantly answering a message through it on whatever social media platform that it comes to me on that was the driver i love that that mate i love that and i and i and i don't know I, I can't put in words like I applaud you so much for having the courage and to do what you've done because again, because I know I've been through it um, you know, myself. And for me, there was a point that I thought, you know, now nah, this is nonsense. I've got to stop this kind of behavior will only end in one way. I'll end up killing myself or something bad will happen to me. Yep. And, and, you know, I have two beautiful kids and, you know, this is not what life is. I haven't worked so hard to become this person. Um, so I totally get it. And, you know, and one of the reasons why I do my podcast is to have these conversations and bring, you know, tell people because so much happens behind closed doors. You Absolutely. know, you know when, when, I, when I actually sent the initial um, note out about the documentary to uh, my close friends that had attended, I actually put in the note that I sent to them, I would love for you to attend and maybe what you actually see in this documentary, whilst not an excuse, yeah. But it might assist you with understanding my behaviours back in those days because this is what all of those behaviours stem from. And, you know, that was really powerful in that, in terms of my friends saying, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you explain whatever? But you know what? You, 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 just, you can't and you don't want to and you just keep it in-house, inside and suffer in silence. That was, as a bloke, what I felt I needed to do. Of course, it's a stigma, especially in Australia. We have this uh, culture where, you know, blokes don't talk about their feelings. Blokes, blokes don't cry. Toughen up, princess, you know. Yeah, go and buy some concrete from bunnies, you know. <laughs> it's Australian culture. It's true. And, you know, the, the strongest person in all this is Sharon. You know, because we've been together, oh, what is it? Um, we've been together 33 years nearly. And she could have walked 50 times, right? And she, she, but what she did was accept the shit, yeah. assist, guide, um, nurture, um, just help in terms of all of it. And, you know, she got serious on a number of occasions and I don't blame her. Um, and it was um, shape up or, or, or ship out. But like the family, our family could have imploded so, so, so many times if it wasn't for her and, you know, her acceptance of it without crying on anyone's shoulder saying he's a dead set prick and these are his issues. She kept it between her and I. And 
you know, I'm sure she confided in her mum at different times without yeah. going into all the absolute detail, etc. But, you know, she, she's the champion in all this. She really is, mate. It's funny you say that because I was speaking to Mitch, your son, the other day. And that's exactly what I said. I said, man, I applaud your dad for what he's done. But she's the silent hero. And, yeah. and I can, again, relate to that. And, and, I, and I met your wife and for the first time a couple of, maybe a month ago or so. And I had a brief conversation with her just about life and, how, and just, just general chit-chat. And I just, the warmth and love I felt from her. Wow. And I said this to Mitch. And I said, Mitch, mate, your mum's amazing. Like, you know, when you feel that energy. Sam, and you know why? She's a really, really, she's a country girl, right? Um, so I'm not distinguishing between country and city, but she's a country girl, right? And she actually only sees good in people. You know, she was a cop for 10 years. And you know, yesterday, after these tragic events um, two nights ago, yeah. you know, she spent the whole day crying yesterday. Yeah. Having spent 10 years in the police force and, and you know, you become part of that family. She yeah. was shattered yesterday, yeah. which for me just shows her character, the sort of person she is, loving, caring, this, that, and the other. She, she's just, she's amazing, mate. She's actually amazing. Yeah, right. I, I, you know, like I said, I could just feel that energy. So, mate, tell me, where, where is, how, do you, how do people access this documentary? How do they can access really it important? by um, going to www.welcomestranger.com.au. The doco is still there. So to your point about why I did it, um, yeah. the, the driver for me, I, I just explained about why yeah. I did it. The yeah. validation for me, Sam, let me just read something to you. Yeah, please. Thank that you. Got, that, I, that I got. And this is one of, I would have had a thousand messages since yeah. the documentary has been released. This one to me stands out because it's relatable to me in terms of me and Sharon. And yeah. it doesn't identify who it is, doesn't matter. But no, no. Yeah. I mean, I just thought you'd like to know that my partner watched your doco the other night and he went to the doctor today to get a mental health care plan to help him with his PTSD. He's a police officer, has really bad nightmares, breaks down, breaks down. He's been angry and depressed for a long time, but didn't know how to tell me and our relationship has been shit. I found your doco. After we watched it, we sat down and we cried for two hours. And he said he feels like that every day. Um, but he just felt all he needed to do was continue to suck it up. I cannot thank you enough for putting it out there and helping my family. I am so happy. I wish you all the best. A day later, hey, Mark, just thought you'd like to know. Um, she goes, I'm so, oh, she goes, hey, Mark, guess what? He cooked dinner tonight, singing, carrying on and jumping around the kitchen. He mowed the lawns. He took the dog for a run and kissed me on the cheek for the first time in God knows how long. She said, when she said when he went to the shower, I had my own little cry because I haven't felt this much relief in 18 months. If he's happy, I'm happy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So much love for what you've done. Wow, wow. And you know, I, wow, like I, I'm speechless. And you know what, mate, like this is what this is all about for you to put yourself front and center and to talk about your emotions and your history and all that, and to get something like that back, it makes everything worthwhile plus, you know. Now, I, I think like, I had a grin from ear to ear and, and there's been numerous like that, right? Some, in, some just short, sharp, some bit more detailed, etc. But yeah. I just picture myself in that dark spot in the back room with under a blanket, the family would go and I would say, I'm not going anywhere and I would hide to then when I was upbeat and happy and felt life was worth living. That's what that message mirrored for me because to picture that guy dancing around the kitchen, mowing the lawns, taking the dog front and kissing his missus on the cheek, just for me, that was it. That's validation that what I have done, I am so happy about and and I'm just I'm just like really really pleased the fact that it, it can make an impact and change people. Sam, it is man. And you know what? <laughs> I never say this, but we can all be heroes in our own way. And what is a hero? A hero is someone that saves a life, you know. And um, and what you've done is phenomenal, man. And I love it because again, like I said, I can relate to it. And to get that kind of a feedback and all we do, like what we do in life, as we get older, it's all about our legacy. What kind of a legacy do we leave behind? You know, yeah. money, fame, this, that, oh yeah, whatever. They come and go. They're meaningless, right? It's about our legacy. And mate, you're leaving a legacy behind by what you're doing. And 
I, again, I applaud you so much, and and I'm so blessed to have met you, uh, because for me, <laughs> it's just I yeah. Love that's it. a really good point because I got asked that in an interview the other day, as far as all that sort of stuff, and and that that word legacy is a really really um, a valid sort of relevance to this, and I, I said that. If at, the end of, if at the end of the day, the legacy I leave behind is that at my expense, I have assisted people with laughter and getting them through an awkward situation and turning a shit day into a good day, then you know what? I'll cop that. I'll, I'll, I'll cop that because at the end of the day, that's about impact and makes me feel good. Makes me it's feel selfless, good. mate. It's about giving back and I love that, mate. I love it. So tell me, um, what what from here? What are you doing with yourself these days? <laughs> oh, actually, I actually work for a um, a company called Fraud Watch International. They've been around for about seventeen years. It's a, a Melbourne guy started it. He's got offices in UK, Dubai, America, and head offices here. It's about online digital risk protection for corporates and for um, businesses and the like. Yeah, but he's sort of branching out into. Um, into protection for celebrities and VIPs who are impersonated um, and, and online and they have people sort of fake accounts about them and yeah. then there's where they create fake affiliations like this Bitcoin scam where people are saying that, you know, um, Andrew Forrest or Russell Crowe or any of these other famous people are endorsing it. So yeah. I've been working with them for four months, um, rolling out this new product, which is really, really exciting to be honest. So that keeps me busy. I'm working from home, which is good. Everyone is at the moment, get that. Um, so a bit of flexibility, but that, that's what I'm, I'm doing at the moment and I'm enjoying it. Yeah, what do you do for fun? Besides getting the kids to pick oh, up. I, don't mind golf. I actually don't mind hitting golf. I'm terrible at it. But Sharon and I are sort of restaurant people. We have, not, not lavish, but yeah. we sort of like to eat out and have a drink and have a chat. That's our sort of, yeah. almost, that's our vice and that's how we relax and have fun. Yeah. All family though, Sam, now with Dylan having Bo, that's yeah. just the, the, the highlight of our life. And we haven't seen him for four odd weeks, four and a half weeks. So yeah. FaceTime and all that, but we're bloody, we're, we're, we're missing him massively. You would, you would. You would. So tell me, um, uh, for people that are out there that are watching this podcast and YouTube and, and listening to it on uh, what about our program, um, what would be your advice if, if someone's if someone's going through what you went through 20, 30 years ago? What would your advice be to them? I think there's two words that, that, that sum it up for me. And again, it's only on reflection that I've realised the difference between these two words and how that can change how you think and how you act, right? I spent my life believing that my journey in terms of footy um, resulted in lots of regrets that for me, I, sh I, I couldn't distinguish between disappointment versus regret. And it's important for people, and they have two key words, and I talked to Dylan about this, understand the, dis the difference between disappointment and regret, right? We all have disappointment in our life. If you minimise the regret, understand the difference between the two, you'll be a happier and healthier person. I love that. Very well said. So tell me, what are you looking forward to the footy coming back? Yes, well, it will be weird in terms of watching it with no crowds, etc. But again, it gives you something to, uh, to to flick to flick on on a Friday, Saturday. Because I, I don't religiously sit down and watch it, yeah. but I like to have that choice if it's there. So we have actually missed it not yeah. being on. But I mean, well, we like everyone else have watched every bloody show on Netflix and Stan. That we're almost up to date with everything. <laughs> That's so true, mate. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I, my show is about entrepreneurship and all that. And, you know, this mental health plays such a massive role. doesn't discriminate. doesn't discriminate. No, no, no. You're right. It, does, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. You're right. It doesn't it, it, discriminate. You know, there are words that I use. And Sam, can I say to you as well that yeah. thank you for your contribution to Mitchell in terms of um, where he's at in terms of headspace, mindset and the like, because I know you've mentored him. I know he looks up to you massively. And as a parent, all you want is the best for your kids, whether they're little pricks or delinquents like my two or not, doesn't matter. You want the best for them. And I know that you've actually given him some real purpose. You've challenged him in terms of how he thinks he's, you know, his entrepreneurship himself, his, his business mind, this, that and the other. So, you know, 
I appreciate what you've done for, for me as a parent with Mitch and that too, Sam. Thank you, man. And I congratulate you because they are the people they are because of the foundation that came from their family and you are that family. And, you know, uh, you know, without you guys and what you've installed in them and how you brought them up, mate, I'll tell you, because they're amazing kids. They have a heart of gold. Maybe their heart comes more from Sharon. <laughs> no. yeah. uh, you know what? It's been a joint effort in terms of discipline our kids, right? Well, we've always wanted our kids to, to respect people, right? At the end of the day, it's about respect. You get out of what you put into it. And, at the end, and, and, and that goes without saying. So we're far from perfect. And at the end of the day, there's no rule book, as we all know as parents. We think we've tried hard. We think we've done pretty well. You know, they've gone off the rails at different times. But the, the, the comforting thing for us is they got back on the rails. And for us, that's about, you know, I think where we've contributed to, to you know, helping them do that. And we couldn't be proud of our kids. Now you've done a great job. And, I, and, I love, and what I love about your family is not just the love, but the honesty and being candid and being real. You have a beautiful family. You're real. Your kids are real. And I'm very, very blessed to have met you guys at Cost Pass. And I can't wait to, for us to do many more things together during you know, our lifetime. Good on you, Sam. Great to talk to you, mate. Have a great weekend and we'll speak soon. Thanks, mate. So everybody, thank you for joining in. Thanks, Mark. If you guys want to listen to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, and also YouTube, subscribe to my uh, YouTube channel and listen to it. And please add your feedback. And um, this is what life's all about. Enjoy life and living your last day. God bless. Thank you.